Good morning. Welcome to Faith Baptist Church. Um, I'm, I'm Pastor Rob, uh, Pastor Rob Loach, if you don't know me, and I'll be filling in today for John Weigel. Um, I'm glad that you came here today, whether you're a longtime member or whether you're a visitor. Uh, I'd like to recognize our visitors at this time. Is there anyone here uh, who this is your first time or first time in a long time? If you'd raise your hand, okay, several over here, a couple back there. Uh, welcome. I hope you'll find a friendly group here today. I think you will. And um, be blessed by the service. <clears throat> Now, you're going to be a little shocked if you come here all the time. You see the bap baptistry set up. We're having it this morning and not this evening. Uh, the reason is um, there were some people who were, want to be here for the baptism who are not going to be able to be here this evening, family members. And so we're doing it this morning out of deference to them so that they could be here for the baptism of their loved ones. So um, it's going to be a little bit different, I mean, very different service. Our services are always different. So. Uh, especially when I'm up here. Okay. Now, you're not supposed to laugh at that. Okay, I think I hear Lana back there. So, anyway. Um, but let's start with a word of prayer, and then um, Pastor's going to come out, and we're going to do have the baptism, and uh, followed by some songs. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you love us. Thank you for meeting each need. I pray, Father, that uh, you will be uh, honored and glorified in our service today. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us health. You've given us the desire to be here. Thank you for a beautiful day. And I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be warmed and challenged and encouraged by what we hear today. Uh, bless these people as they are um, going into the waters of baptism, uh, beginning uh, in a sense, their public uh, life with you by identifying with Christ. I pray that this will be a really special time for them and for their loved ones. Bless in all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. you will never forget this is a little nippy well what a joy it is to be able to see fruit that abounds and we look forward to how it's going to bring forth more fruit when the Lord laid upon my heart the need for a daycare preschool to do a lot of things for the ministry the real goal was that we would be able to reach into our community and to be able to introduce the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who needed to hear it and uh, to be able to share with them the love of Christ, to be able to see people come to Christ. And so uh, what a joy to be able to see the new Hans come and to meet them. And I remember in my office, Leo and Kalina, I thought they would get saved then. Leo got saved that night. Kalina, uh, either the next Sunday or the following Sunday after that, trusted Christ. They have followed the Lord and believers baptism. They have been added to our church. And now Olive, and uh, she has trusted the Lord Jesus as her savior, and uh, she wants to live for Christ. And she learned that baptism was just simply an opportunity to let everyone know that she's a Christian and that it is her desire to serve the Lord. And what a great thing to see that happen at six years old. So much better than at 60 years old, where she'll have her whole life. Now she's six years old, she's still learning of what it is to serve the Lord, but we're so thankful for that. Olive, do you know the Lord Jesus yes. as your personal savior? And is it your desire to live for him? Yes. 
then I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life by Christ Jesus. That was cool, wasn't it? <laughs> sing a song after the Lord's Supper, which we're having this evening, so you can come back for that. But it's called, I Love You, Lord. So let's stand and sing both verses of number 444, I Love You, Lord.
be seated. All right. I had to do a quick transformation and get warm. Don't worry, I'll get even with that L rod. But anyway, I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't know what happened, but it's all okay. And uh, Olive, she was very understanding. And uh, praise the Lord for fruit that is being born and will remain and bring forth more fruit. Part of an offering is that simple principle, is that God has entrusted to us that as we're responsible and obedient with that which he has given to us, and we give it back out of hearts overflowing with gratitude and love, that he takes our offering, he blesses it, he multiplies it, and he uses it that it might bring forth more fruit. And then the fruit that comes from our obedience, he keeps really careful track and will one day at judgment day reward us for our faithful stewardship and obedience. And so we're thankful that we have this part to participate in an offering. Ron, would you pray and ask God's blessing, please? Our Lord and our God, we are thankful. Thankful, Lord, to be here. Thankful, Lord, for the blessings that you so richly bestow upon us. Lord, thankful, Lord, that fruit that comes from our labors. We pray, dear Lord, that you would uh, bless this offering now, Lord, and help us to give cheerfully, Lord, back from that which you've blessed us with. And help us, Lord, to honor and glorify you in all that is said and done here, we pray in Jesus' name.
Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Eunice. Beautiful. God of the small. Turn to Acts chapter 1, if you will, and uh, put a finger in Acts chapter 1, and then go over to Luke chapter 1, and uh, put a finger there. And most of you know that um, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he also was the author of the book of Acts. And so uh, God used this man to write down that which the Holy Spirit of God moved upon him to write. And so everything that we have in the book of Luke, everything that we have in the book of Acts, everything we have in our whole Bible is written by the Spirit of God through holy men of God that he used to put down in holy writ that which we can learn from and read and love and respect and obey. And so I hope that today that you will have your eyes opened to some of the real motivation that changed the apostles that was the forerunner to you and I receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Part of our salvation story 
part, part of our salvation experience was the faithfulness and the boldness of these apostles to carry the truth that was in, entrusted to them and take it to the uttermost part of the world. And you ask yourself this question, what changed in these apostles? What was it that changed? Because something changed. These were the same group of men who, as they walked with Jesus and they watched him do amazing things that, that blew their minds, really, with the miracles that Christ was able to do and, and flabbergasted them and, and left them speechless. And, and they just were awed at the power of God as he did so many miracles. They were awed by the wisdom of God as Jesus would open his mouth and teach them the truths that were to be entrusted to them that they would carry throughout the entire world. These same disciples after the crucifixion were afraid were frustrated, were rejected. And Peter said, I go fishing. You remember, Jesus had called him from that. And yet, here he was after three and a half years of walking with Jesus and being ministered by Jesus and watching Jesus do amazing things. Now that he was on a cross and had given up the ghost and paid the price of the sin of all mankind, Peter said, I'm going to go back to what I was doing. Peter, out of fear, rejected the notion that he was with Jesus, denying three times. And the cock crowed. You remember the story. Thomas saying, oh, unless I put my finger in his nail-pierced hands and run my hand into his spear-riven side, I will not believe. What changed for these men? As they were gathered together, in the upper room, and Jesus himself is going to make an entrance. And he's going to reiter some, reiterate some things that he had taught them, and he's going to remind them of some commands that he had given to them, and he's going to encourage them with some things that were going to absolutely revolutionize their perspective and energize their ministry to the point where we are blown away in the book of Acts with the power of God that is on display and the fruit that is born. As a pastor, I get all of the time, I hear of a new book that's written on church growth. There's a new seminar that is going to be put together on how to build your church. There's new movements uh, on what will make people attracted to your ministry. And, and we have all of these man-centered, though they're not all evil, ideas of what it would be to have our church grow. And yet, I have found that there's no greater manual, there's no greater example of what God wants to do in building his church than the book of Acts. And that's what we want to take the next several weeks, okay, maybe the next year, and go through on Sunday mornings, what is it? that Faith Baptist Church really needs to learn if we're going to do church.
the way God designed it and put his wisdom on display for everyone to witness about Jesus. I've entitled this message, The Story of Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, thank you for the word of God. And thank you for giving us instruction. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is our confidence and our hope. Knowing that it is because of your resurrection that we know there is eternal life. We know that sin has been conquered and paid for and death has been conquered and has no bearing. We thank you for the indwelling of the Spirit of God and we pray, God, that you would help us to better understand what that means. And God, I pray that you'd help us as we introduce this great book of the Bible and embrace the truths that have been entrusted to us. The prophecies that come to light and fruition and some of what are on the precipice of coming to fruition even in our day. And so, God, I pray that you'd motivate the Christian. I pray, Heavenly Father, that if there's one here that does not know thee as their personal Savior, that you would show them and convince them of how much you love them. And that you have done everything necessary for their sin to be forgiven. But they must turn from their sin and their self. To put their faith solely in the finished work of our Savior. That they may receive eternal life. God, I pray that you'd minister in a special way to each person. And encourage us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 1, verse number 1 says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. What is the former treatise that Luke is referencing? He's referencing the Gospel of Luke, that which was written also to Theophilus, and we'll prove that in a minute, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. In other words, the book of Acts is going to be a story about Jesus. The book of Luke was a eyes witness of the life of Jesus. It's one of the synoptic gospels as Luke gives us an eyewitness account of the ministry and teaching and person of Jesus Christ. Here he is saying that I have written this, Theophilus, that you might have a better understanding of who Jesus is, what he says, and what our responsibility is. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of them, pertaining the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanding them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, which he saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he, Jesus, said unto them, It is not for you to know the time or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses, really the idea, you shall be my witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when they had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, Two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, 
Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. I'd like to ask you the question, what changed? What changed for these apostles? What was it that gave them this amazing boldness to preach Jesus Christ? What was it that allowed them to endure torture and even death for the cause of the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ? What changed? What was it that emboldened this group of men? I think that the resurrection, the reality that Jesus said he would rise again, and here he is. I watched him die on a cross. I watched him be buried in a tomb. And I see him in front of me raised from the dead. No doubt that was part of the difference. But what else? Oh, I think it was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. The fact that now they had received power that they had never known before. That they were indwelt by the Spirit of God to do the will of God for the glory of God. And this Spirit of God fell upon them and indwelt them. And they received power. And I believe that encouraged them. I think that emboldened them. But I think there's another piece that is incredible that happened that sometimes gets ignored or doesn't get the attention that maybe it should. And that is that the Old Testament prophecies begin to make sense. These things that they embraced by faith and taught in obedience, but did not fully understand were all of a sudden making sense to them. And they were understanding that the program of God was right here. And it was unfolding before them in real time. And they, what they knew to be true and trusted by faith was now living proof in front of them. And they realized, oh, my Savior is alive. He arose from the dead, and he is who he said he was and is and will ever be. We have the Spirit of God who has indwelt us, and now we are empowered by God himself to do the work that he's called us to do. And we're participating in a program that we better understand for the first time. Remember Peter? Jesus meets with his disciples and he says, I have come from my father and I'm going to die. And it's necessary that I die. Now, now... The, the apostles were, were fluent. They, they were well-versed in Old Testament truth. Uh, they, they had studied it their whole life, and, and they could articulate it. And, and they no doubt maybe even had Isaiah 53 memorized, and, and, and they realized that, that Jesus Christ would come as a Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world, and he would be led as a sheep to the slaughter, that he who had done nothing would be smitten and stricken of God and afflicted. And they realized that we, all we like sheep, had gone astray and turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Oh, they knew the facts. They knew the doctrine. They they could tell people what Jesus had said. Oh, but they, they didn't completely understand. It was data to some extent, but not reality. Something happened to those apostles as they began to see what they had witnessed was the fulfillment 
of the prophecy that they had preached and taught and believed all of these years. And that God was unfolding his program in real time. I can't help. One of the reasons why I believe the Lord has directed me to teach and to preach the book of Acts and to do my best to make it come alive for all of us is because I believe that we too are living on the precipice of God unfolding so many prophecies and fulfilling so many promises. And we're watching so many things happen in real time. Oh, we've believed them and we've preached them and we have, have articulated them and lived in light of them the best that we could understand. I've said this before and I said growing up, I believed that all of the world would hear of Christ's coming all at the same time. I, I believe that. I didn't know how it would happen. And with today's internet and social media and all of the things, even third world countries, they may not have a flooring and they may not even have a door, but they have a cell phone. Priorities, right? It's, it's crazy. I, I remember going door to door visitation in the Philippines. And, 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 and going from door to door, and, and you don't go knock on the door like here in the States. You stand out by the mailbox, and, um, and, and, you, um, and they hear you. And um, many times I go up to uh, the, the, the house, and, and it's just a simple, modest home with a heavy blanket for a door. And, um, and they come out, and they peek, and they say, hi. And, um, and you introduce yourself, and most of them speak English, at least to some degree, because I don't speak Tagalog. And, um, and, and we would at least be able to converse to some extent. And, um, and it was amazing to me. Many of them would come through that blanket door with a cell phone in their hands. And I would think to myself, wow, how life changes. We heard that you, know, you would not be able to buy or sell or get gain. In other words, you, you, you will not be able to go to the grocery store and buy things. You will, you will not be able to keep your jobs and to make a living. You won't be able to do things unless you receive the mark. Now, I do not believe that vaccine passports are the mark, so don't misrepresent me. But I do think that we saw how Life would demand that you have proof of something in order to function in life. And so, uh, so much of the world would have to embrace this in order to get into a stadium, in order to keep their job, in order to buy certain things. And, and we're watching real time the unfolding of thousands of years of prophecy that we've believed and preached and lived in light of. And we're watching them unfold in real time. Much of what the apostles were experiencing with the first coming of Christ, we're on the precipice of potentially experiencing the same thing with the second coming of Christ. And I think some of the things that we can learn from the apostles in the book of Acts are some of the same things that can be applicable today and the things that emboldened them and encouraged them and made them courageous and watch the gospel transform the known world at that time can happen again. And it could start at Faith Baptist Church. Turn back to Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> Turn back to Luke chapter 1. He is writing to Theophilus again, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth and order a declaration of those things which are most surely beloved among us, or believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers to, of the world, it seemed good to me. 
also, having had perfect understanding of all things, from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou... Now, understand what Luke is saying. Theophilus, I want you to understand the truths that I'm going to give you, that the eyewitness account of the life of Jesus. I cannot change you. I cannot truly motivate you. And I cannot really embolden you and give you courage. But the things that I'm going to write about Jesus will. That's what he's saying. So he says, here's the things that I want you to understand. Verse number four, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. There was in the days of Herod, a king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. In other words, he begins to say, let me give to you some prophecy. Let me, let me unfold some stuff for you, Theophilus, in real time. Remember that there was predicted a forerunner of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Lamb of God. There was, there was a prophecy that, that was given that, that was going to introduce an individual to us. Well, let me tell you, <clears throat> there's a man, Zacharias, who's a Levite, and he has a wife who's Elizabeth. And just to make things a little more interesting, they can't have children but God is going to use them to bring about the fulfillment of prophecy. He's going to introduce this man named John the Baptist, who is going to introduce the Messiah as the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. And the book of Luke is just going to keep going with prophecy and teaching of Christ that is unfolding the reality. Many times the disciples didn't understand Remember, as Jesus is introducing that he is going to die, and Peter said, oh, no, you're not. What was that? You say, well, that was just Peter putting his foot in his mouth. Possibly. He, he was known for that. That's why I like him, right? But I think it was more than that. I think Peter didn't understand. He didn't fully grasp who Jesus was, why he had come, what was necessary in order for sin to be forgiven. And he, in his own mind, is saying, oh no, that's not happening on my watch. And what did Jesus say to him? Get thee behind me, Satan. In other words, you can't even understand the program and purpose of God, and you are siding with the program and purposes of Satan. You, you literally are standing in the way of what it is that God the Father has already ordered for the Son. You, you don't grasp it. You don't fully understand. Judas betrays Jesus Christ and the soldiers come and, and you know, Peter, whoo, doing the Zaro thing, right? And people say, wow, Peter had so much precision that he just took his ear right off. I doubt it. I think he meant to split him right down the middle. He was just a bad aim. He was a fisherman, not a soldier. Now, I don't have any proof of that, but nonetheless, Jesus picked up the ear of Melchus and put it back on and healed it. I don't know about you, but if I'm Melchus, I'm not arresting that guy. Right? Peter just didn't get it. Remember the end of the book of John? And Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, who do men say that I am? And he said, well, some say you're Elias, and some say you're, you're uh, I can't remember who else he said. But anyway, he said, but whom say ye that I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father. In other words, you're grasping this. At the end of the book of John, of John he says to Peter, do you love me? He said, I love you. 
Jesus asked, do you agape love me? Do you love me with a sacrificial love? And Peter said, I phileo love you. I love you like a friend. And Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And do you agape love me? And he's like, I phileo love you. And Peter was grieved that he asked him a second time. And then Jesus asked him a third time, Peter, do you phileo love me? And Peter said, I phileo love you. I love you like a friend. I'm not, I'm not willing to die for you. I'm not willing to sacrifice my agenda for yours. And I'm not really willing to sacrifice what I want out of life for what you're telling me. I, but I do love you as a friend. And the, what did Jesus say to him? Peter, you're going to grow up spiritually. In fact, Peter, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to be emboldened and you're going to have courage and you're actually going to die for me. And what did Peter say? What about John? Right? That's what the text says, John 21. And uh, Peter and Jesus says, don't you worry about John. John, I got a plan for John. You just concentrate on what I have for you. Right? <clears throat> Turn all the way to the last part of the book of Luke. Just like that, today I've preached to the entire book of Luke. Luke chapter 24, verse number 44. So here are the bookends. Luke is introducing what we're going to find out about Jesus Christ in this great book. He's concluding his book, and he says in verse number 44, And he said unto them, the disciples, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. Disciples, I want you to know that my program is set, the prophecies are promised, and they will come to fruition just like they were said. And you need to understand that. I taught you, and you must get this part right. And he says, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Disciples, Please understand something, Jesus said. All that was written in prophecy about me in the Old Testament law, in Psalms, in the prophets, they must be fulfilled. And then, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Do I think the resurrection of Jesus Christ made a difference in these apostles' lives? Oh, I sure do. Do I think the empowering of the Spirit of God as he indwelt them made a difference? Oh, I think it did. But this verse right here, I think, is part of what we miss happened at that moment when Jesus was ascending into heaven, is that he is opening their eyes to understand the significance of the prophecy as it relates to Jesus Christ. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise, the Holy Spirit, of my Father unto you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endowed with power from on high. And he led them out of out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Turn back to the book of Acts. <clears throat> You say, Pastor, what 
was the difference. Well, I think as we get into the book of Acts, you're going to find that they begin to understand the significance of the prophecies that they had believed and how they directly related to the person of Jesus Christ. And they fulfilled with boldness and incredible courage preaching Jesus Christ. You see, what happened is that they were told they were forbidden to preach in the name of Jesus. Do you remember that in, the, in Acts? And, um, and we'll talk about that as we go. And, and, and Peter was like, listen, it was you guys who put the Messiah on the cross and we preach Christ and him crucified. Listen, you do to us what you need to do but we are going to preach Christ. Now, it's an interesting thing that uh, when we get into the book of Acts, that we're going to find that at the end of chapter 1, Peter begins to articulate and to give us really prophetic teaching as is being fulfilled. He's really producing Old Testament truth in this. He says it as it relates to Judas and the betrayal and the needing to, to come up with another person. In Acts chapter 2, two lengthy portions of direct quote from the Old Testament in Peter's sermon uh, at Pentecost. Uh, in chapter 4, we find that there's another segment of Old Testament prophecy that he is reminding people as they begin to understand the significance of Old Testament prophecy coming to fruition just like it said it was going to. And I believe that that too emboldened and gave courage to the disciples. Interesting dynamic, right? If you and I begin to really wrestle through this idea of what does God want for the church? Because the book of Acts is, is God is going to turn his program from the Jews to the Gentiles and grafting them into his program and the introduction of the local church. And you and I are part of his program and we embrace what it is that God has called us to. And we now stand responsible to do what? To carry the truth that has been entrusted to us to a world that needs it so desperately, right? I don't believe that we've ever seen in the world what these apostles saw right at the beginning of their ministry. You want to talk about church growth, right? We find that at the end of chapter 1, there's 120 people gathered together. Nice start to a church. By the end of chapter 2, we have 3,000 added to the church. By the end of chapter 5, we have 5,000 men plus women. And it's interesting that that's the last time that there is a numerical significance given to the growth. After that, we find that the words that he just simply added daily. In other words, there were people getting saved every day. How many? It doesn't tell us. And then it says that those added to the church were multiplied and multiplied. And then it says that they got outside of Jerusalem and there were churches being planted in Ju uh, the Gentile world, in Judea, in Samaria. And these were astronomically blessed of God. And the numbers were beyond giving quantification to. In other words, he just stopped saying how many. I don't know about you, but I'm just kind of curious that way. Kevin's my numbers guy, right? And, and I'm sure he would like to say, well, what, what are the numbers? I mean, how many are we talking? And he doesn't tell us. He just simply says it was so magnificent. Well, what 
was it that created that kind of growth? What's the secret? What did these churches do that, that, that created such amazing growth? Can I tell you? It's really simple. Everyone went every day, and they told somebody the story of Jesus. That's what they did. They preached Christ and him crucified. And they just did it all day, everywhere, anytime, anywhere that they went. They knew that the need for people to know Jesus was the greatest need that anyone had. And therefore, it was more important than the stock market. It was more important than their entertainment. It was more important than any other aspect of life was that people would hear about Jesus and the story of Jesus. Well, what about us? There's a lot of people who are saying why our churches don't grow like they once did. Most of the excuses are to make us feel better about our laziness, to make us feel better about our lack of focus, our misplaced faith. You know what I think would happen if churches like Faith Baptist Church just got back to understanding what has happened to us because of the resurrection. Because he arose, we too shall rise. We have confidence. We have assurance. We have absolute hope in knowing that this life is temporary and it's only an opportunity to take people to heaven with us. It's not an opportunity to fulfill our bucket list. It's not an opportunity for us to just live life to the fullest and to experience the American dream. And all of those things may be opportunities that we get to experience in life because God has graciously given us life. But that's not my motivation. It shouldn't be. I'm here because I am a witness of the person of Jesus Christ. I have been given the Holy Spirit of God to empower me in this opportunity to share Christ, to share the story of Jesus. I, I don't have to rely on my ability. I don't have to rely on my education. It's not about how long I've been saved. It's not about how uh, good I can debate. It's not about me. Everybody in this entire building and under the voice of my preaching can participate. Why? Because we all as born again believers have the same Holy Spirit to empower us to be witnesses to tell the story of Jesus. The question is, will we? Are we? Yes, the resurrection is a motivation. And yes, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is a true help and power source. But what about this piece of the Bible coming true? prophecies unfolding before our very eyes. What is it that we represent as born-again believers? We represent Christ, not ourselves. It's not about our own life. It's about the life of Jesus. And so our attitudes, our actions, our articulation or our speech should all help people understand Jesus better. And the fact that, what did he say at the end of Luke? That he came, he was crucified, he was buried, and he rose again. And God gave them understanding of scriptures that they may be empowered and they may be emboldened in order to share the gospel. I think as we go through the book of Acts, you're going to find time and time again that those three aspects were amazing 
in those apostles which turned them from cowards to courageous. I don't know about you. Maybe you said, you know what, I haven't shared the gospel with anyone in weeks. Maybe there's some here that say, you know what, I haven't tried sharing the gospel with anyone in months. And maybe there's some people that say, you know what, I haven't tried sharing the gospel with anyone in years. Can I just encourage you? You know why we're here? To be witnesses of the story of Jesus. We ought to be telling someone, at least handing them a tract. I'm so thankful that our church participated in an opportunity between Good Friday and Easter. And I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was hundreds of thousands of tracts that were given person to person across the nation as people em embraced the challenge to take some tracts and hand them person to person. You know what those tracts are? They're simple manifestations, stories about Jesus and him crucified. What turned the world upside down with those apostles was the story of Jesus. What will turn Clinton Township and Michigan and our nation and our world upside down for the cause of Christ? The story of Jesus. The question is, will we share it? Every head is bowed, every eye is closed, nobody's looking around. Father, thank you for the calling that you gave to these apostles that they have faithfully taken that truth and they have taught it over the years to those who have taught it, to those who shared it with us. And now it is our turn to be responsible with this amazing privilege and stewardship. With heads bowed and eyes closed and nobody's looking around, there may be someone here that would say, Pastor, God spoke to my heart. I'm here and I've never trusted the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I'm here and I'm interested and, and I'm curious, but I've never personalized the story of Jesus. I realize I'm a sinner and I realize I am unfit for heaven. And I believe what Jesus did, he came in order to fulfill the requirements and the punishment and payment of my sin. And I believe that God accepted it and proved it when he raised him from the dead. But I have personally never turned and repented of my sin and myself. I still want what I want and I pursue what I pursue. And I am not antagonistic, but I have never personally accepted my personal responsibility to turn from my sin and to trust the finished work of my Savior, and to receive by faith the gift of eternal life. But I'd like to do that this morning. Well, I have good news for you. You can do it right where you are. It's simply you communicating your heart to God's, and you do that through prayer. And you can do it quietly. You can say where you are right now, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I cannot get to heaven on my own. But I believe Jesus died for my sin. And he paid for it in full. And the best way I know how, I'm asking you to forgive my sin, to save my soul, and to give me eternal life. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you turned from your sin and trusted the Savior, I can on the authority of Scripture tell you, that you just became a child of God and you just became indwelt by the Spirit of God. And I'd like to rejoice with you. I'll not embarrass you. I'll not point you out in any way, but I would love to just pray for you. Is there someone here who would say, Pastor, I just trusted Christ as my Savior and I believe I just became a child of God and I'm unashamed of it. And I would like for you to pray for me. Is there anyone like that? Pastor, I just trusted Christ as my Savior. Anyone like that, raise your hand up right where you are, and I will pray for you. Anyone like that? Then Christians, can I ask you the question? What are you doing with the story of Jesus? Are you hiding it under a bushel? Are you being reckless and careless with the responsibility? Have you just excused the fact of your inability personally or your lack of time or whatever else? But you realize, I am here 
as a witness to the story of Jesus. And I want to be responsible with that. Would you respond and talk to God? I promise you, he wants to use you as a witness, and he will, just like he did those apostles. You'll experience courage like you've never experienced before. And God will bless you as he did those apostles and give you fruit for your labor. Father, would you finish this message for your glory? Would you help us to do and believe what you have said? May we have our eyes opened to understand the scriptures, that we may too be emboldened by the resurrection, the indwelling of the Spirit, and the truth of your word. And may we tell the story of Jesus wherever we go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Song number 357. Tell me the story of Jesus. If God spoke to your heart, you can respond right where you are. You can come and pray. You can ask one to pray with you. We'd be happy to help wherever we can. But let's sing from our heart, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. You may be seated. Let me encourage you. We do have a track rack, and uh, the track rack is there uh, for you to use. Uh, take what you will use and ask God to bless it and to use you as you tell the story. And uh, let's make this a concerted effort individually and as a church that this week we're going to tell somebody the story of Jesus. Hello, it's um, getting close to that time of year again. We took a year off uh, for the ladies' conference last year because of all the um, construction and everything that was going on here and getting moved in here. But August the 6th is our ladies' conference, and our theme this year is Fear Not. Um, this is going to take a lot of hands this time around with the newer building, and um, we're hoping for a bigger um, outpour from other churches to come. Um, we do usually have a pretty good handful of people that come from other churches to this conference. Um, but we're asking for volunteers to help. Um, if you, one, we do workshops, um, like breakout sessions, crafts. If you are a crafter or have some good idea for a workshop that might work, um, please sign up in the one stop. Uh, if you have questions about the workshops or the craft, and you want to say, is this something that might work, please see me or Michelle Berlin, um, and we will let you know. Um, also, we need volunteers to help for different things. If you like to help with decorating, um, you want to come and help and work with that, you want to help with music, you want to help with um, just in general anything that you're like, hey, I don't know what I can do, but I'm willing to help, um, please sign up in the One Stop. Um, ladies, if you could do that, that would be great. Um, then we will come for you later. Um, um, that day we do ask the help from the men to help serve that day to be a blessing to the ladies. So if that is something that you, as a, you have that day and you would like to give that time, um, please be praying about that. And if you can do that, let us know. Um, also, one last thing. 
Um, one thing we do do is like door prize type gift baskets. If you have a business or you're just wanting to donate a basket, um, please see me. Um, we just like to kind of do that in between sessions to kind of wrangle people in and um, it's just kind of a nice little thing to do. So if you can do that as well, please let me know. Thank you. All right, thank you, Gretchen. I have so many comments right now, but I'm scared of Gretchen, so I'm not gonna say anything. First off, uh, first announcement, we have a teen snack tonight after the evening service. That is going to be over at the old school building, and this is a parent-teen kickball game. Uh, there is no basketball tonight, and uh, parents, if you are nervous, uh, Pastor Lewis has said there's three tables set up. There will be one after the game for ice cream. That will help you drown your sorrows from losing to the teens. Second table has uh, icy hot ibuprofen and Tylenol and crutches. Third one has a medical doctor to write notes for you that will not be able to get out of bed on Monday. So, uh, but that will be a great time of, uh, for you guys uh, tonight. Uh, teens and parents, kickball game at the old school building following the evening service tonight. Uh, secondly, we have, um, you see in your bulletin, the Cars for a Cause. Um, that is our upcoming uh, fundraiser for our soccer field. Um, but that is not, it's, there is a car show, but there's a lot more going on with that. And we have the uh, Little Leaders Academy is going to be running a mom-to-mom -mom sale. So if you want to be a vendor for that or you just want to come shop, uh, please plan on that. If you want to be a vendor, you need to uh, reach out to uh, Alyssa Schlump and uh, you can uh, talk with her about that. Uh, the other one is we're having a big garage sale for our seniors, our uh, senior class at the school. Um, and so if you have those treasures that you would like to unload from your basement, from your storage, all those Christmas presents that you receive that you look at and go, do they even know me? I, why would they give me this present? If you have those kind of things, if you have all of those good intention gifts that you took in that you say, I'm not really ever gonna use this now, we would like you to start dropping them off Sunday nights after church. Mrs. Johns will be out by our bus garage and uh, she will be collecting your treasures for this garage sale. Uh, so if you need to set up a special appointment, reach out to Mrs. John, she's right down here in the yellow sweater, um, but you can see her if you need to set up a special appointment. But uh, Sunday nights after church, drop off your treasures for those garage sales. That is all I have. I have one more announcement by Mike Duke, and then he is going to close us in prayer. The one thing I like about Faith Baptist Church is you have an opportunity to minister. Um, I pulled up, I was telling our practical Christian living class this morning, I said I pulled up, dropped the family off this morning, and the young man was at the door giving us a bulletin, and I just thought about the different ministries that Faith Baptist has. If you'd like to minister at Faith Baptist, there's an opportunity to. Uh, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 12, 18, but now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. We have another opportunity to be able to minister. I don't like calling it a nursing home. I like to call it this is assisted living for seniors. Uh, uh, you never know one day you end up could be in there. And I, I like to refer to me as a senior assisted living ministry instead of a nursing home. But, um, we had an opportunity to minister there. Uh, as you, many of you know Kelly's uncle. He's the pastor emeritus, Temple Baptist Church of Roseville, pastor there for some 30 years. And he is now a resident there recently. And his son-in-law dropped him off. He lives in another state. And he was talking to Jennifer, the, the uh, uh, affairs lady there, of the uh, community affairs lady. And she said, do you know of anybody who could have a church service for these folks? And he says, yeah. He says, uh, I can uh, refer you to uh, uh, Pastor Michael Duke. And she called me and she said, Pastor Michael Duke? I said, no. But I said, thank you for the uh, connotation. But I said, I'm just a minister, just serving Lawrence. I'm not a pastor. She said, we'd like to have a church service here for the folks here at the New Hampton Manor, brand new place. She said, I called several churches and she'd call there and they said, we're not doing that anymore. Uh, we don't do that kind of ministry. 
and I, she called us and asked us if we would like to do that, and I said, all right, ma'am, I said, I'll think about it, let me pray over it, and it was kind of like the, uh, maybe the office seeking the man, or just the, the, the Lord put this right before us, we said, we could minister to these folks, we've been involved in it before for a short time, but I called her back, I said, we'd be delighted to be able to minister there, so we're going to do this this second Sunday, might be flexible, the second Sunday of the month, just one Sunday a month, won't take a lot of time, we're going to be there for an hour, it'll be right after church, so we have to scoot right out of here, but We'll start about 1.30, be there about an hour. It's literally right down the street from us right here. If you walk 10 minutes, you'd, you'd reach it. It's about a minute and a half from where I live, uh, maybe even not that, but uh, we're going to have a ministry there for the seniors there. You say, what can I do? I'm gonna ask some of you to preach. I'm gonna ask some of you to sing. I'm gonna ask some of you just to be there as a congregational singing. We're gonna plant you amongst the people who are there so that you can sound like you're a, a great choir singing, but it's an encouragement to those folks uh, that are there. Uh, when you uh, just imagine if you were there and uh, you didn't have any church service we we have this every week here and they don't have any church service so we don't want to overload ourselves but we're going to try to do this once a month once a month so it'll be days today today start at 1 30 uh the address is right there if you'd like to join us please come down and uh we would love to have you fellowship with us all right all right let's pray father we thank you for the opportunity to be able to be in your house again we thank you for the message of the book of acts uh, describing the, the infancy of the local church. Lord, we are truly blessed here uh, to be able to have Faith Baptist Church. We've heard the commentary of many folks, but we want the smile of you upon our life, and we're thankful that we believe, Lord, we have a New Testament church here. Lord, I pray that you would solidify the message that the pastor has spoken us today concerning the lost. Lord, if the early church had done the job and continue to do the job throughout the centuries, the world would have been one to uh, you many years ago so lord i pray that you'd help us to do our duty to preach the gospel to those that are lost seek the lost lord and, and as your word says to compel them to come into thy house we, lord we pray that you would keep the message always upon our heart help us to be being clean vessels when we distribute this message lord so that we're not contradictory we do ask that you bring us back together in the next point of service we pray in jesus precious name amen 